Why would somebody laugh when a member of their family dies? In this video, we're going to tell the story of the first time that a beetle experienced the loss of a loved one. We're going to celebrate the life of George Toogood Smith, John Lennon's uncle and surrogate father, who had a profound impact on John's childhood and personality. We're going to explore John's startling reaction to his uncle's sudden death in 1955, and dive into the psychology behind why, in the grip of grief, he laughed like a maniac. Hello, and welcome back to the channel. My name is Charles Bliss, and I'm a psychedelic journalist from Norwich, UK. If you're new here, on this channel I make videos about the Beatles, psychedelics, and death, as I write the manuscript for my first book. This is the first video in a new series of obituaries I'm doing, exploring the lives and deaths of people connected with the Fab Four. There are many incredible Beatles stories about loss and grief that go far beyond the Paul is dead conspiracy theory, which have never before been collected in one place. So please subscribe and hit the bell icon if, like me, you have a morbid fascination with the Beatles. John Lennon's childhood was turbulent and painful. He was born on the 9th of October 1940 at Liverpool Maternity Hospital to Julia and Alfred Lennon. John's father was a merchant seaman and was absent for the majority of his childhood. His mother Julia was a free spirit and while her husband was away at sea she started another relationship with a man called John Bobby Dykins and soon found herself pregnant once again. In 1946 Alf returned to Liverpool and he took John away to Blackpool with vague plans to emigrate to New Zealand with him. Julia tracked her husband and son down in the seaside resort where the young family agreed that John would stay with his mother in England. Alf disappeared and John did not see his father again until the height of Beatlemania in 1964. But Julia's sister, Mary Elizabeth Stanley, known as Aunt Mimi to John, felt that Julia and Bobby's living arrangements were inappropriate. She contacted social services and eventually Mimi was given the responsibility of housing and caring for the child with her husband, George. George Toogood Smith was the maternal uncle of John Lennon. His unusual middle name was given to him in honour of his paternal grandmother, whose maiden name was Toogood. True to this, George was a kind and generous man. He was born on the 13th of March 1903, one of eight children to parents Alice and Francis Smith. For four generations, the family operated a dairy farm business in the village of Walton, Liverpool. The family endured its fair share of heartache. One child died in infancy. Another brother, Robert Smith, was killed in action on the 30th of August 1918, during World War I. On the 4th of April 1932, George's father, Francis Smith, was reported missing from his home on Allerton Road. Two months later, a police constable found his decomposing body in a pit in Dodds Lane, Speak. At an inquest, the city coroner ruled that Francis Smith took his own life by drowning whilst of unsound mind. George was six feet tall, wore a suit and tie, and smoked a pipe. He managed the family's two dairy farms, along with a retail outlet with his brother, Frank. George was a cowkeeper and milkman, delivering milk throughout the village on a horse and cart. He endeared himself to the neighbourhood's children with his sweet rendition of the Scottish folk song on the banks of Allan Water while on his rounds. One morning, while making deliveries to Walton Convalescent Hospital, George met his future wife. Mary Elizabeth Stanley was a resident trainee nurse when George started courting her in the spring of 1932. The couple married on the 15th of September 1939 at Bolton Street Register Office. In 1942, the couple bought a semi-detached house at 251 Menlove Avenue and named it Mendips. The purchasing deposit was paid with money inherited from Francis Smith's suicide. The British government requisitioned the Smith family's farmland during World War II 
and George was called up for military service at the late age of 38 and became a member of the British Expeditionary Force. He took part in the Battle of France, which resulted in defeat. After he was discharged from the army, George left the milk trade. He worked at an aircraft factory in Speak, as a tram and bus cleaner at the Walton Depot, and started a small bookmaker's business. John Lennon lived with his uncle George and aunt Mimi throughout most of his childhood. They were his legal guardians and George was a surrogate father to John. When the dairy farm was still active in the early years of World War II, George took his nephew around Walton on the milk cart, proudly showing him off to customers as if he was one of his own. As a boy, John loved to go with George to the milking parlour or to visit Daisy the cart horse in the field. In the autumn of 1947, the Smiths began accepting student lodgers from Liverpool University. The longest serving lodger was a man called Michael Fishwick, who took up residence at Mendips in October 1951 and stayed until December 1958. He said, George Smith was very fond of John, and John was very fond of him. It was a good relationship. He treated John like a son. Uncle George helped to develop Lennon's literacy by bouncing the boy on his knee and reading aloud the Liverpool Echo newspaper. He also took him to the local picture drone and bought him comic books like the Beano and the Dandy and read nursery rhymes to the child at night. The house had no television, but a wireless radio stood on the sideboard in the morning room. George wired it to an extension speaker in John's bedroom so that he could listen in bed. George also taught the young Lennon how to ride a bicycle and bought him an emerald green Raleigh Lenton bike in 1952 as a reward for passing his 11 plus exams. Mimi remembered that when George came home at night, he would open up his arms and John would fly into them. She said they were like two trains colliding in the doorway. Their relationship was an affectionate one and the two often kissed each other, a ritual that John called giving squeakers. On the 4th of June, 1955, Mimi and lodger Michael Fishwick were finishing a meal in the morning room at Mendips when they heard Smith collapse on the staircase. The biochemistry student rushed from his seat at the dinner table to find Smith bleeding internally. He was bleeding from the mouth. It was pretty obvious it came from the stomach, a hemorrhage. He was rushed to Sefton General Hospital, but never recovered. George Toogood Smith died aged 52, on the 5th of June, 1955. He was survived by his wife and fathered no children. A post-mortem established the cause of death as cirrhosis of the liver, non-alcoholic, and burst abdomen. He was buried in the graveyard of St. Peter's Church in Walton, close to the grave of one Eleanor Rigby, who died on the 10th of October, 1939. Two years later, on the 6th of July, 1957, John Lennon would meet Paul McCartney for the first time at St. Peter's Church Hall Fate, a short distance from Uncle George's resting place. John was 14 that summer and away in Scotland when George collapsed. He found out only when he returned to Mendips. Mimi said he came bouncing in, his usual excitable self, and asked where George was. When I told him he was dead, John just went very quiet. He didn't cry or anything like that. He just went up to his room. If there was any crying to do, he would do it on his own. He wouldn't want anyone else to see him like that. John's cousin Layla, the daughter of his aunt Harry, kept him company that evening. Layla remembers arriving at Mendips to find Mimi sitting outside on the coal bunker, looking lost. Layla said, it was a terrible shock to us all, but especially to John, who looked on him as a father. Their bond was deep, and paternal, and with George's death, John was robbed of a positive masculine influence at a critical time in his adolescence. The manifestation of Lennon's shock and grief was not the typical response we would expect from an adolescent boy erupting into tears, but instead to grin like the Cheshire cat and burst into fits of laughter. We both had hysterics, Lennon later remembered, although Layla doesn't remember joining in. We laughed and laughed. I felt very guilty afterwards, he said. John's crazed laughter was something that happened on more than one occasion when he encountered loss, including the death of his best friend and the Beatles' original bassist, Stuart Sutcliffe, whose story we will tell in a future video. It even appears in what is often considered the Beatles' most monumental song, A Day in the Life, 
After reading the newspaper and discovering that his and Paul McCartney's friend Tara Brown, the heir to the Guinness fortune, had died in a traffic collision at the age of 21, Lennon sings, I just had to laugh. John's reaction is often cited as an example of him being callous, cold and cruel, but I would suggest that it's much more complicated than that. I see it as a reminder that there's no right or wrong way to grieve. Death can be an incredibly uncomfortable subject for many people. As a child of 14, John had never been in this situation before, and so how can we expect him to react appropriately? And why do we feel like we can define the appropriate response to something as incomprehensible as death, especially a sudden death? Laughing, giggling, and smiling are perfectly normal nervous reactions to any uncomfortable situation, including a death-related one. It can be an unconscious way of protecting oneself from a more raw emotional experience. Also, John famously had a dark sense of humour, which can be seen in his drawings in his book In His Own Right, so it is possible that something about the situation John found morbidly comical in some way. Another reason could be that he was simply trying his best not to cry. Children taught not to cry during their upbringing in overt ways such as shaming or in covert ways such as never having sadness or crying explained to them are less likely to display these negative emotions in front of others. His aunt Mimi said, I think John was very shocked by George's death, but he never showed it. The keep calm and carry on mentality of Britain in the post-war years might have taught the young John to keep his negative emotions to himself. Aunt Mimi typified the stiff upper lip attitude of the times. She said, our world was never the same. John took it on the chin, but never the same. The place seemed empty, but we muddled on. I mean, you don't give up, do you? An expression of laughter during grieving can be what is called a manic defense, a kind of coping strategy to help us repress or escape painful emotions. It can therefore be used to divert the overwhelming reality of what's happening, including our realization of human vulnerability, our own mortality, and the irrevocable end of life. In the gay science, philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche claims that laughter is precisely what we need in the face of a meaningless world. He argues that gaiety is the greatest medicine and weapon we have against abysmal thoughts. In short, laughter is living. Laughter can also alter dopamine and serotonin activity in the brain, and endorphins secreted by laughter can also help people who are in a depressed mood. It is not known whether John attended his uncle's funeral and burial at St Peter's Church, but we do know that the 14-year-old John wrote a poem for Mimi on the day. The third line is adapted from Young at Heart, a 1954 song by Frank Sinatra. Mark Lewison writes, This poem for Mimi is the first example of John Lennon expressing his feelings through popular song. One of Lennon's most widely criticised lyrics is in the song When I Get Home from 1964's A Hard Day's Night. When I get home tonight, I'm going to hold her tight. I'm going to love her till the cows come home. The cliched phrase, till the cows come home, seems at best simplistic and at worst lazy, ridiculous and trite. But if we consider this line as a small homage to his Uncle George and his childhood memories of visiting the dairy farm, the complexion of the lyric changes and becomes tinged with sweetness and sadness. John wore his uncle's shirt, suit and tie to his Liverpool College of Art interview in 1957. And Cynthia Lennon remembers John wearing his uncle's threadbare coat for years afterwards. It was not John's first loss, in the sense that he'd already been effectively orphaned by his parents. But it was the first death of a loved one that he'd ever experienced. One of many losses that would recur throughout his life until his own nightmarish assassination in 1980. Paul McCartney, who was taught handwriting and English by George's brother Sissy Smith at school, remembered Lennon later saying that with his father leaving and his uncle dying, John began to feel like he was a jinx on the male side of the family. It wasn't long before another fundamental figure in John's world would lose their life, which we'll talk about in another video in this series. So please subscribe and hit the bell icon so you don't miss future episodes of the Beatles obituaries. Peace.